Okay, the next item of business is a statement by Keith Brown on policing in Scotland 10 years on from reform. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of his statement and therefore there should be no interventions or interruptions. Uh, and I call on the Cabinet Secretary for around 10 minutes, please. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. The, uh, as we approach, in fact, the 10th anniversary of our National Police Service, I am pleased to make this statement to the Chamber with my reflections on the continuing police reform journey since 2013. I will also offer my thoughts on Sir Ian Livingstone's recent announcement that he intends to retire as Chief Constable of Scotland later this year. Sir Ian will be greatly missed, of that there is no doubt. His contribution to the success of policing in Scotland has been immense. But he leaves Scottish policing in excellent health, with the service having been completely transformed over the last 10 years. Eight local legacy forces have been replaced by one national service, providing a more strategic and consistent approach to policing than under the previous system. One of the most significant public sector reforms since devolution, and it has been a success and one I believe that is recognised across the Chamber, if not in every part of this Chamber. In 2019, the then Justice Committee stated its belief that the, police intention, the policy intention rather, to create more equal access to national capacity had been met and should be considered a success story for policing in Scotland. That was the Criminal Justice Committee. And that success has been demonstrated by the successful policing of COP26 in 2021, Operation Unicorn in 2022, and by the policing of the COVID-19 pandemic. Since reform in 2013, £11.6 billion has been invested in policing. And this continues. In the most recent budget, the Scottish Government has recognised the importance of policing by investing £1.45 billion in 2023-24. This is an increase of 6.3%, around £80 million, to the Scottish Police, uh, Police Authority resource budget. And it also provides a stable basis from which to improve the delivery of policing and to enhance the safety and security of communities across Scotland. Despite the UK Government making cuts to the Scottish Government capital budget, we have maintained the police capital budget, which has more than doubled since 2017-18, supporting investment in police assets, estate, fleet, specialist equipment and ICT. And the money we put into the police continues to be invested in the workforce. Our officers are the best paid police officers in the UK, with starting salaries for constables around £5,000 per year more than in England and Wales. And there are more officers too. As of 30th of September, there were 30 officers per 10,000 population in Scotland, compared to 24 officers in England and Wales. And our investment has also paid dividends in terms of crime. Sir Ian has rightly highlighted Police Scotland's murder clear-up rate as one of the strengths of the service in recent years. I would also point to Police Scotland's significant role in ensuring this week's statistics that show that Scotland has one of the lowest levels of recorded crime seen for any 12-month period since comparable records began in 1974. And I believe these statistics are a credit to the hard-working officers and staff of Police Scotland. Uh, President officer, before I look to the future, it is worth reflecting on the legacy of the longest serving Chief Constable of the UK's second biggest force. Uh, no operation was bigger than COP26 when the eyes of the world were on Glasgow. We hosted hundreds of world leaders and dignitaries amongst thousands of delegates that descended upon the city. Under Sir Ian's leadership, demonstrations were policed in the traditions of Scotland's policing, ensuring that legitimate protest could be undertaken fully and safely. Scotland's right-based rights -based system of policing, coupled with Police Scotland's engagement with activist groups and an overriding common-sense approach, resulted in under 100 arrests linked with the event, staggering numbers given the scale of COP26. More recently, the sensitive and effective operation put in place following the death of Queen Elizabeth is something Sir Ian can be rightly proud of. And perhaps above all, it is Police Scotland's response to the COVID-19 pandemic that has been rightly praised as officers took a measured and proportionate rights-based approach to their handling of an unprecedented crisis. As with our health professionals, police were at the forefront in keeping us all safe, and we owe them our gratitude. I also sincerely hope that the Chamber will join me in paying tribute to Sir Ian's legacy. I was grateful to Sir Ian for his agreement to extend his contract when his initial period of appointment concluded last year. This ensured continuity and stability as we emerged from the pandemic. 
I think it's always been clear that at some point he would decide to step away from his role. And as he himself said last week, he will have been an officer for 31 years by the time he retires. So while last week's news is obviously disappointing, it was not necessarily unexpected. It will be for the Scottish Police Authority to conduct the process of finding Syrian's replacement, but ministers will, of course, be asked to approve the appointment, appointment of his successor. And sitting at Syrian's side has been an executive team that is brimming with talent. Just a few weeks ago, Deputy Chief Constable Jane Connors took up post, bringing a wealth of experience with her from the Metropolitan Police. And several new Assistant Chief Constables have also been appointed as the team continues to evolve. Serene has paid tribute to the stability and leadership of his senior team, and I would also like to ex express my confidence in this continuity as we move towards the final months of Serene's time in office. Serene will continue in the meantime to set Police Scotland's strategic direction. Last week, last week the Scottish Police Authority considered a draft uh, revised joint strategy for policing, and this builds on the principles in the existing 2020 strategy while ensuring policing in Scotland keeps pace with the challenges and opportunities of modern society. But, Presiding Officer, it is right that 10 years on we continue to reflect on what the next steps in the reform journey should look like. In the last decade, we have seen significant changes in the profile of crime and demand, including increasing cybercrime and greater vulnerability. At the same time, there has been an increasing focus on how police respond to important societal issues, such as violence against women and girls. We have also seen significant changes in digital technology and public expectations about how they access services. And these trends are likely to continue and indeed to accelerate. So we need to plan for the future and ensure that policing reflects these trends and changes and is able to respond to future challenges. Our national vision for justice in Scotland, published last year, sets out a transformative vision of the future justice system for Scotland, and Police Scotland will, of course, play a vital key role in that. However, I do recognise that the public sector faces a challenging budgetary environment, combined with the cost of living crisis and the resultant impact on communities, hardly surprising after 13 years of austerity budgeting from the UK Government. Our plan for the future must therefore demonstrate the efficiency and value for money which is necessary while continuing to keep the people of Scotland safe and secure. And for policing, this will mean an even greater emphasis on collaboration with other criminal justice agencies, and in particular, where possible, with the other blue light services, to ensure the public receive the most effective and efficient care and protection. It will also require a relentless focus on making sure police are deployed where they add most value and work efficiently with other agencies. So in setting the budget for the upcoming financial year, the Deputy First Minister was clear on the challenges that lie ahead and that further efficiencies and savings are still required to ensure Scotland has financially sustainable, person-centred public services. So it will be, of course, a time for change. It always is. But it also has a number of constants. As we commemorate the 10th anniversary of our National Police Service, and as we look forward in the coming months to welcome a new Chief Constable of Scotland, we can be sure that the fundamental values of policing – fairness, integrity, respect and human rights – will remain. The purpose of policing set out in the 2012 Act remains paramount – to improve the safety and well-being of people, places and communities in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. The Cabinet Secretary will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement. I intend to allow around 20 minutes, after which we will need to move on to the next item of business. And I would encourage members wishing to ask a question to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call Jamie Green. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance copy of his statement today? And I too would like to place on record my best wishes from these benches to Chief Constable Sir Ian Livingston on his retirement. And thank not just him for his three decades of service to the police, but all those who have served under him over the years. But it's no coincidence, presiding officer, that on the same day he announced his departure, his own jointly penned report into the future of policing stated a damning truth that many of us have known for some time. His parting shot of warning to the government is that policing in its current form is, I quote, unsustainable. Why is that, Cabinet Secretary? Because everybody knows that policing in its current form is picking up the pieces of far too many other 
broken services. It is responding to an ever-increasing volume of mental health problems and situations, problems which are someone else's responsibility. But the problem is there is no someone else to deal with these issues. It's taking up so much of their time and it's taking time away from other vital policing and that includes fighting crime. So I have to ask the Cabinet Secretary, when will he too admit that the status quo is simply unsustainable and it cannot continue, that too much is being asked of too few today in Police Scotland? And does he think that Sir Ian is right, that the current direction of travel in policing in Scotland is unsustainable? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I should say that my answer, which I'm about to give, is informed by a number of quite lengthy conversations with the Chief Constable on some of the issues which uh, Jamie Green has just raised. And I would say that it's made more sustainable if, for example, we have the best paid police officers in the UK, if we have more police officers per head of population in Scotland than elsewhere. I did hear uh, at the committee a number of times from Jamie Green and others that we were about to see perhaps a reduction uh, in police numbers down to below 14,000. Well, the only way that would happen is if we tried to match the numbers of police officers that the Tories have in England and Wales. We would be down over 2,500 police officers. Well, you have an answer that I'm giving you, Mr Green. If you could listen to it, please, that would be, I give you the same courtesy when you spoke. So I do think it's of course the case that there are challenges which remain. The Chief Constable has been clear. I've mentioned two areas in terms of violence against women and girls uh, and also in relation to uh, cybercrime. It is not sustainable to have the same approach that we've had before and that has to change. And the police and the Chief Constable are, are well aware of that. And another uh, factor which will have to change and which the Chief Constable uh, is very much behind is of course what I mentioned in my statement in terms of the reform of Blue Right Services. So of course things have to change. Of course, existing challenges have to be met, but we also have to anticipate future challenges. And the last point, Jamie Green mentions fighting crime. I have never heard once any word of congratulation from the Tory benches on the fantastic track record of fighting crime of our police forces. Down to 1974 levels. This week, a further reduction, 2%, in recorded crime. Not once have the Tories thought to congratulate either the Chief Constable or our police services on that record. Katie Clark. Thank you. And on behalf of Scottish Labour, I associate my party with the tributes to Chief Constable in Livingston and indeed to the work of the whole of Police Scotland. And as has been said, Chief Constable Ian Livingston has also warned that the cuts being proposed to Police Scotland are unsustainable. The Cabinet Secretary has referred to 14,000 police officers. Last year, the Criminal Justice Committee were given projections of police officer and civilian staff numbers with a frozen budget. More money has now been made available, but we don't know what proposed police numbers are. So could the Cabinet Secretary confirm his understanding of proposed numbers of both police officers and civilian staff for the coming year and outline his strategy to recruit and retain both police officers and civilian staff, given that we know the officers leaving the service is a significant problem? Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, I think some of the. Um, uh, thank Katie Clark for her questions. First of all, there are no cuts to the police budget. It's a 6.3% increase we're proposing for the police uh, in the forthcoming budget, a 6.3% uh, increase. Uh, the budget was not frozen. I realise why that discussion happened because of the RSR, but the budget was not frozen. The money uh, was found. And in terms of recruiting and retaining police officers, just to repeat the point, if you pay police officers in Scotland on average £5,000 more per year when they start to work in the police, you have a better opportunity for both recruiting and reta uh, retaining police officers. I think there is more to do beyond that. One challenge I would acknowledge is in relation to diversity within the police force. We are seeing increasing diversity at the senior levels. In terms of gender diversity, we are not yet seeing that at the levels it should be in terms of uh, ethnic diversity, and there is more work to be done there. And that is not just in terms of recruiting, but retaining people who have joined the police force from um, ethnic diverse backgrounds. So I would not pretend that this is all uh, done and dusted by any means. There are challenges which remain. That is why I talk to people involved in these issues within the police service, why we have other bodies that do uh, monitoring and checking of the police's progress in this area. So there is more to do in terms of recruiting more broadly and retaining more broadly, but in terms of the basic package which is offered to police officers, uh, I think the fact that they have got such a tremendous track record in fighting crime is testament to the fact that we are recruiting and retaining some excellent police officers at this current time. 
Audrey Nicholl to be followed by Russell Finlay. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Despite Westminster austerity, the Scottish Government have increased police funding year on year since 2016-17, and I welcome the fact that, that the Scottish Government has further increased the policing budget by £80 million in the next financial year. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary how the budget will help Police Scotland responding to the changing nature of crime? It was, as we mentioned, it's uh, an increase of around £80 million in 2023-24, a 6.3% increase. In my view, that will help to improve the delivery of policing and support the safety and security of communities across Scotland, but also will enable further collaboration and co-location opportunities with blue light services across Scotland. So we are ensuring Police Scotland is sustainable, adaptable and prepared for future challenges. The point that was made, I think, by Jamie Green at the start of his question was about other services and how they can pick up um, uh, some of the uh, work in relation to this. And of course, that's also a challenge, not least in relation to health services. But I think by expressing the need, uh, sharing that view with the police, that there has to be reform within the police and blue light services as well, we will ensure that the service is improved to the people of Scotland and, of course, will continue to fund the demands on the police service uh, through government grant. Russell Finlay to be followed by Rona Mackay. Th thank you. If Keith Brown uh, has never heard praise of policing from Jamie Green or my colleagues, he clearly has not been listening. Now, on the SNP's watch, the health and careers of innocent whistleblowers have been destroyed. Millions of pounds of compensation have been paid out, but victims silenced with non-disclosure agreements. Officers on the grip of a suffocating complaints process have even been driven to suicide. For the sake of Scotland's police officers, will the SNP government fix the system that it created? Yep. Cabinet Secretary. Yeah, well, I, I can say, though I haven't heard, and I cannot bring to mind any point at which anybody in the Conservative bench has said, well done to the police in getting crime down to the levels they've had. Good on the Scottish Government for making sure that police officers are paid £5,000 more a year. Good on the Scottish Government for making sure we have higher numbers of policing in Scotland. No, I've never heard that. I have heard, I have heard constant, constant denigration of the police service from the Tory benches. And I can tell them, and I can tell them from talking to police officers on a regular basis, the police know that. Just because you tag on SNP government to the end of it, they know what the target is. They know the way you've denigrated the police forces. They understand that point. And of course, Russell Finlay is also aware that one of the things which we are doing in terms of the police complaints bill that's coming forward to this parliament is to address some of these historic issues about how complaints, whether it's whistleblowing complaints or other complaints are dealt with. And that will be in addition to the current uh, means of redress through the PERC and so on. So we do take these issues seriously. We do understand there's need for reform and that reform is coming. Rona Mackay to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I was very pleased to hear that uh, Police Scotland um, reflects and represents the diversity of Scotland's population. Um, can the Cabinet Secretary say that if he thinks there's sufficient strategy within Police Scotland for that to continue uh, and, and continue to improve? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think I would say to Rona Mackay, as I said in response to the points made by Katie Clark, I think there is more to do in this area. Uh, the National Service has, though, detailed plans already underway to enhance recruitment, leadership and training to develop a culture which reflects its values. And I welcome initiatives such as the Policing Together strategy that outlines the range of actions that Police Scotland are taking under DCC Taylor's leadership to mainstream equality, diversity and inclusion within the service and to attract, retain and promote a diverse workforce. The more the police service in Scotland looks like the rest of Scotland, the more trust will be built up between the people of Scotland and the police force. So I know the police take this seriously. So does the Scottish Government and will continue to make sure we have a more diverse and inclusive police force. Rhoda Grant to be followed by Fulton McGregor. Um, can I also uh, wish Sir Ian Livingston well in his retirement? The Cabinet Secretary is aware that Dame Ailish Angelini's report highlighted ongoing issues with Police Scotland regarding discrimination in the service. And his previous answer to Katie Clark suggested that Ruth, recruitment of ethnic minorities was still a problem. And that gives us all concern because obviously culture change comes before recruitment. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what specific steps he has taken since the Ailish Angelini's report and what outcomes have been achieved? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I'm happy to provide a very full breakdown of those recommendations from Ailish Angelini which have been implemented, which don't require legislation, but the member will be aware we will bring forward, in addition to that, very shortly, legislative changes. So that will give 
uh, the member a full account of all the changes that we propose. But on the particular point that she raises in relation to diversity, I meet and have met regularly with, for example, Robin Ifla, who is conducting the review, who is somebody I have known for a very long time, uh, and others within the force whose job it is to make sure there is a more diverse force. I would say that we have a challenge not just in recruiting people from ethnic minorities, but in keeping them. And that suggests to me there is more to be done in making sure the culture, as you've mentioned, as the member has mentioned, of the police force has got to change to make sure those people feel welcomed and valued. So there's a lot of work going on behind the scenes, but the explicit response to Elish Angelini's recommendations, which we accepted, I'm happy to provide a full account of everything that's been taken forward and what's still to come forward because it requires legislation. Fulton McGregor to be followed by Beatrice Wisher. Thank you, President Officer. Can I also put on record my thanks uh, to Sir Ian Livingston for all the work that he's done. Um, despite the Tories' politicking on this issue, they surely cannot deny the facts that police officer numbers in Scotland remained well above those in England. So does the Cabinet Secretary agree that the fact that we have more police officers with higher wages shows the value placed in the vital role police officers play and that policing and the safety of communities is clearly a priority for this Scottish Government? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think if you were, I agree with Philip McGregor. If you were to be objective about this and look in and say, well, does this government value this service? The fact that you're paying £5,000 per year for a starting person in the police force would tell you there's a, a level of priority attached to it in Scotland, which is not true elsewhere. So I agree with that point. And also that we have more police per head of population than England and Wales, 30 officers per 10,000 population in Scotland compared. I know this is difficult for the Conservatives to hear, but they're going to have to listen to it, unfortunately, for them. We have 30 officers per 10,000 uh, population in Scotland compared to 24 officers per 10,000 population in England and Wales. So we have a tremendously well-funded um, and well-remunerated police force, although we'd always like to pay more, of course, that's the case. And the success of that is shown in the extent to which we now have fewer victims and fewer crimes because of the effectiveness of the police force that we have here in Scotland. Beatrice Wishart to be followed by Stuart McMillan. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance, advance sight of the statement and I'd like to associate my party with the comments made in tribute to Sir Ian Livingstone as he retires. There is a sense in some rural and island areas that centralisation of Scottish police services has meant a loss of tried and tested local policing with the imp imposition of city-style policing, such as that seen recently during Lerwick's Fire Festival. But works in the central belt doesn't necessarily work in island communities. So is the legacy 10 years on from the formation of Police Scotland not simply millions spent in a merger, but a distancing of law enforcers and those they, who they protect and serve? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I, th I think the point that's made, it's not just about the money that's spent. I would accept that point that's been made by the member. But I have... And I can't recount the specific details, it would be unfair to do so, but I've got testimony from senior officers who served in North of Scotland uh, police forces in the past that are hugely complimentary about the capacity that they now have in relation to a national police force. We saw that most recently. I know that uh, Stuart Millen is asking a question in his constituency where the specialist services that can be brought to bear by a national police force can much more easily be done so, given the fact that they have the ability to direct them around the country rather than the old eight legacy forces that we have. It should be the case, though. It's, of course it should be that it reflects the community in which policing is undertaken. And the points that the member has made will be taken on board and I'm sure are listened to by the police service and I'm happy to relay them to the police service as well in order that we can further improve the service. Stuart McMillan to be followed by Maggie Chapman. Thank you, Representative Officer. Awesome. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware I've actually written to him uh, this week uh, about what I'm about to raise. And one of the, the welcome outcomes with regards to the Unified Police Force was to have flexibility of officers being allocated to areas of need because of specific incidents at that time. And can the Cabinet Secretary provide an assurance that this flexibility continues and that this will be utilised in my constituency at present due to recent serious issues? Cabinet Secretary. I very much agree with the point that Stuart McMillan uh, is making, not least because I think he's referring to a number of really quite exceptional uh, incidents which have happened at the same time. And I would just say, if that were the case in a smaller police force, then the ability to respond to a number of incidents uh, at the same time, some of which required specialist services, of course, is more difficult. That's one reason why I think the National Police Service works. I would also say a number of the very smaller, uh, very much smaller police forces in England and Wales do struggle with this kind uh, of pressure when it comes on a very high profile case, the comms that are required, the specialist nature of uh, some of the expertise. So but Stuart McMillan has got every right to expect that the full uh, benefits of the National Police Force should be brought to bear in relation to the incidents which he's managed. And I'm sure once again the police will have heard his message. 
Maggie Chapman to be followed by Colette Stevenson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance side of his statement. Scottish Greens believe that an effective police service must be community-based, enjoy public support and reflect the people it is responsible for keeping safe. The Cabinet Secretary has made some comments about the diversity of the force and the work still to do on this. When considering violence against women and girls, can the Cabinet Secretary provide more information on how people in Scotland can be confident that police will be part of the solution and never, as we have seen elsewhere, part of the problem? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I know it uh, underlines the very real concern that Maggie Chapman is expressing here, some of the high-profile cases that we've seen, and it's not just been in the Met. Of course, there have been challenges here in Scotland as well. Uh, I think there are a number of ways in which that can be tackled. Um, the member knows some of the things in terms of the bills that we're bringing forward in this area. We mentioned Daly Shangelini's uh, recommendations. I'm happy to provide the same information uh, to the member that I previously said I'd provide uh, to Rhoda Grant. Uh, and I do think, because I, I talk very regularly to uh, senior officers, especially the senior officer team, they are extremely committed to this. And I mentioned in my statement that, along with cybercrime, the ability to tackle violence against women and girls is one which is growing. I've mentioned that we had this, this week another indication of a reduction in crimes, but that also contains within it an increase, a small increase in violence against women and girls. So I think the police are very well seized of this. And I think if you look at the comments of the Chief Constable and what I've said in my statement, it will be a huge priority for the police in terms of violence against women and girls going forward. Colette Stevenson to be followed by Murdo Fraser. Thank you, President Officer. There have been many good reforms to policing in Scotland in recent years. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide an update on the rollout of trauma-informed training within the police and how this will benefit members of the public? Cabinet Secretary. Well, in relation to this and a number of previous questions, of course, these decisions are often for the police themselves. We don't uh, have any operational control, quite rightly, over the police. It's written into the legislation. So it is for the police, in concert with the SBA, to take this forward. But the member will know that we have the justice vision, which requires every part, every agency, every body within the justice system, if the system can be called that, uh, to undertake trauma-informed training, to make sure that the response that people get it's got to be more than uh, criminals being captured and the right verdict being delivered in a courtroom. It's got to mean that those victims and witnesses and other people affected by crime or who interact with the justice system have to have a trauma-informed approach. And it is the case, whatever we think of it, that most people, for example, in prison have a trauma-related background, usually adverse childhood experiences. So that commitment is there, but it will be for the police to make sure it's taken forward right throughout their force to the extent that it's not already been done in many parts of the police force. And Murdo Fraser. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, police forces elsewhere in the United Kingdom are already on their second generation of body worn video cameras. But here in Scotland, they have not been rolled out routinely, and Police Scotland described the equipment already issued as basic. Even supermarket workers now have these body worn cameras. Why don't all our police officers? Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. I'm not sure, I know he's been in this parliament a long time, but I'm not sure if he is sufficiently aware of the fact that the purchase of capital equipment, in fact any equipment, is for the SPA and the police force, the chief constable himself, to undertake according to the priorities that they see. I don't deny that I would like to see more body-worn cameras amongst the police as well, I think mainly because they can, in the end, reduce costs and reduce crime as well, so I have uh, full some support for that. It will be a question of resources, it will be a question of how the police and the SPA, SPA prioritise that spend as well, uh, but of course the fundamental point is if you start off from a priority of making sure that police officers are well remunerated and well supported by having a number, the, the right number of police officers, then you start from a good basis. It is something which has been looked at by the SBA currently and they'll certainly have our support in making sure that as many officers as possible have body-worn cameras as we move forward. Thank you. And on a personal level, can I add my thanks and good wishes to Sir Ian Livingston on his retirement. That concludes this item of business. There will be a brief pause before we move to the next item of business.